as much as we can, we are going to break into some breakout groups in about 20, 25 minutes and give you a chance in smaller groups to have discussions about some of the things that we've talked about and then come back together and share some, some thoughts on it. Um, and this is very much, we see it as a first of a, a two-parter and we'll explain at the end how we're going to um, move on to that second part. Um, obviously, I'd like to welcome uh, Mark to the evening um, and we're welcoming Mark to the club. In the last two weeks, he's joined us here, um, which is an exciting time for us as a club. It's exciting time for, uh, hopefully, for Mark, but it's certainly an exciting time for our players. Um, and, and the one thing that we'll delve into a little bit is, I suppose it'll be a bit like an extended interview for Mark, but um, we're going to find out a bit more about him how he likes to operate, things that have worked, things that haven't worked. And I think the one thing I would say right from the start, neither of us are going to come at this from a point of view of perfect. And, you know, you've heard that phrase about coaches losing and managers losing the dressing room. Let me tell you, I have. And it's not a pleasant experience. And I've been sacked once in my time as a coach, and that was at Kent. Um, and the, uh, the idea of losing the dressing room, I lost them. Um, and I lost them for a number of reasons. Um, and we'll explore some of those tonight. And I, and I think the key thing about tonight is even though Mark's experience, obviously, of winning trophies at Sussex um, over a long period, and then obviously culminating in winning the World Cup with the England senior women's team, you know, he's got a lot of experience. He will also share with us, hopefully, a few things that he's tried and they haven't worked. And I think that's the key with all of us as coaches and captains, that there is isn't, there is no perfect. There is not only one way to do something. And it is about um, having the, I suppose, having the guts, having the strength to try things. But the more experience you gain, the one thing you'll come to realise is every team has the same people and the same characters, they just have different names. And when we go through some of this, there'll be characters that will pop up in your heads of players you've either coached or been in the same dressing room with, same team with, and you'll start to put names to them as a guarantee that there's no, there's no real rocket science to this. There's a lot of trial and error, but experience teaches you along the way that it's about having the, I suppose, the guts to try things. And more often than not, things start to happen and play out and you've been through that experience before. And that's something else that, that you'll, you'll definitely recognise as you go through it. And things will start to happen to you as a coach in your team and you'll think, I've been here before. I know exactly how this plays out. I know exactly how I need to deal with this. But you need to be in those tough situations to actually come through them the other side. So enough to start with from me. Mark, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Brilliant to have you with us. Um, I suppose the, the first thing would be, in, in terms of managing a dressing room and managing a team, what, what are your non-negotiables? What, what are the key things that you think every good dressing room should have? And the second part would be, from experience, what are the things that a dressing room can't have to be successful? Not necessarily winning trophies, but to get people playing good cricket and enjoy being in that team. So what are the things that you like to have, the non-negotiables in your team, in your dressing room, in your dressing room environment, as it were? I think, look, first of all, I've got to ask, again, a question on the interview. What would a Mark Robinson training session look like? I love energy. So I love a group to have energy. I love a session and us to have intent. Um, and I love us when we've got a smile. So it's that, that balance between the team going around the business with a purpose and you can feel an energy about it, um, but it's got a sort of relaxedness around it as well. That's when you know your team's in a good place visually in a training session. What you try, I try and create, what I know I need or want is good foot soldiers. You know, your dressing room's generally is only as good as your, as your foot soldiers are in it. So you need these rock solid people who can carry your word out, your instructions out and can police a little bit for you. That's sort of what you try to get to. 
where you say, and then you try to chuck in some mavericks in there, these match winners, these people who can do the things that the foot soldiers can't. But you've got to get that balance right. You've got to get your, your people who dig the garden and the odd person who'll display the roses. I like that. I've never heard that. I've never heard that before. You say they, yeah, you learn something new every day. I've never heard that before. T so tell us about your your foot soldiers. What do you want from your foot soldiers? And what do you mean by that? What do you mean by a foot soldier? So I reckon I was a good pro. I was a really good, solid pro. I'd support, I'd try and support the captain and the coach, especially for respect of the coach. I would try and put out fires in the dressing room. You're trying to soften the word of the coach. You're trying to self-police. Um, at times you're trying to make sure people are doing the fielding drills at the right standard or sending the youngster home because he's been maybe he's, he's on that second pint too many. It's just that type of thing that helps you you out. Those solid, reliable people who do the dirty stuff and sometimes maybe aren't appreciated enough. And every team's got them. Every club's got them. Every you know club that will do the donkey work and you know get to next sessions early and help you put out the all the practice stuff there's always those people isn't there that you just need just those reliable rock solid people that every club every team every dressing room needs and in terms of your mavericks then i mean we, we hear a lot and we've heard a lot about you know we, we we've all heard of certain players that people say oh you know they're the maverick they're the they're the, the uh the difficult to control players i, I remember trevor bayliss when he first came to England saying one of our problems in English cricket was that we were very quick to get rid of the, the difficult people. And, you know, we, we tended to, at 16, 17, 18 in our youth programmes, get rid of those difficult people because they didn't conform, they didn't always turn up on time, they were a little bit difficult to handle, but actually you're almost knocking out of them at 16, 17, 18 what you want them to have in them at 23, 24, 25. Yeah. So he, he was very much about, you know, let, let's let's enjoy those people and let's enjoy the challenge of them. What was your take on a Maverick? What 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 when, when is a Maverick good for your team and when's a Maverick tough for your team? They're always tough to manage sometimes. It depends on the characters, there's different types. So if we go back to the youngsters' point of view, I've got I've got a beef sometimes with academies. That bit like what you're saying is that they're trying to we're trying to get these he's always on time, he's brilliant in the gym, he's perfect. You know, this so we have these little robotic people who but they can't cross the line. You know, you need the people who can cross the line out there in the middle and do the dirty stuff. Who in a team meeting will voice an opinion and it might be different to, to yours. And you need that. How many times we've we been in team talks where nobody has anything to say? And sometimes the danger is we bully out of youngsters, their personality, as I say, as opposed to accepting. So I'd, I'd go to, like talent spotting. So I was at Sussex for Joffrey Archer. You do not earn your money spotting Joffrey Archer, but you might make your money by managing somebody who's not obvious or spotting somebody who's not obvious or managing somebody who's a bit difficult. That's as a coach, that's where you make your money. That's where you earn your reputation. It's, is moulding somebody and keeping somebody in the environment long enough and moulding them so he actually starts to deliver against his potential. And that's where the environment comes in because you, I mean, I've been speaking to the boys here, you know, trying to have one on one. So I was speaking to a senior player today. And the danger is, I came from a tough environment at Yorkshire, and I was said to him, he was telling me an example, he was the same club. And he said, You gave me an example. And I, and I, and I said, is that right? Just because that happened to you, is that right? That he was allowed to speak to you like that? It's not like this bullying almost of, of youngsters. So, and in terms of the, then you need these other players, I think, in the team. You, you know, your Shane Warns. Um, I'm trying to think who might be an example. Ben Stokes would have been, I guess, as more in Farby's area for a while in the England team. Who can just do things that you can't, the rest can't but they will bring you a little bit of something else extra as well. And it's managing that without it being a distraction for the team. And I think that the line, in my opinion, is it's when sometimes some of their other behaviours start being outweigh, they're positive, what they give on the pitch starts to outweigh the negative that it might be bringing, the distraction. 
uh, the outside press or publicity, when that flips too much, that's when it's probably needs to be dealt with, dealt with and the player that might need to exit. But you just, you do need these players who can win your games. As I say that, and they are, they're often a bit different. The best players in the world are different. They're a bit more stubborn, they're a bit more hardy strong, they're always a little bit different, got their own opinions. And they'll just need managing to an extent. The, 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 we'll, we'll come on to we're gonna we're gonna go into a breakout group shortly, but we'll, we'll come on to um, team meetings, team talks, and getting the best out of people because we we all know that you, you can't just have one approach for every player. Um, and I'll share some experiences after the breakout about the Sri Lankan team and how it was really important for the younger players to take their advice from the senior players and almost give us as coaches the green light to chat to younger players about their game and their technique. Um, and that was something that was very obvious to us in that environment. I just want to take you back though to the, um, so in terms of setting out um, your non-negotiables, how do you go about that? What, what do you do? Do you get your team together and say, right, this is my way? Or do you infiltrate people's minds by chatting individually and then soak some of your ideas in and then get the team together and they actually come out with your ideas. And that's that's something very similar to what we did with England One Day Squad. We kept saying leading up to the World Cup 2015, 16, 17, we've got no plan. We're just playing. We're seeing where we can get to. We just, we, we've got no ceiling. We're just going to keep playing. And then eventually when we started having team meetings, the players started using some of our phrases or some of our words. And they then shaped the, the, the game plan that where they took through to the World Cup. Um, and, and that was a very deliberate plan by us. So we did have a plan, we did have an idea, but we soaked it into their minds and we didn't. Um, so what, what would you do? How would you go about? So here, we, we start in here. How are you going to get your messages across without just sticking notices up on the wall? What are you going to do? I mean, I'm speaking to the whole group properly. It's pretty it's a nightmare, isn't it? Because everything's um, COVID and you can't get your team together in the same way. So I'm going to speak to the whole group a week on, a week tomorrow on Zoom and the support staff. So my way generally would be, I've been doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings, a bit like you were saying, you're trying to get your message across in a, in a subtle way and, I always start off with when I'm sitting down with a player is what can I do for you? What what do I what what do you need from me? That's always the starting point. How can I help you? It's always the starting point. But from the group point of view, I'm going to tell them about me. This is me. This is my background. This is slightly to degree how I see the world, why I see the world. Um, tell them about my, wet, my, my resting bitch face that I've got at times. Um, and just try and get them to understand me a little bit. That'll sort of go from that point of view. I want to tell them where I want to go. So I think it's always important to have a vision. Uh, I want to tell them what, you know, our end up point or our next stopping point is going to be winning all the comp winning both competitions, the big ones, 2020 and championship. That's going to happen. I'm not quite sure when, but it's going to happen in the next three to four years. Hopefully sooner than that as well. But it's going to happen. We'll win both. That's where it's going to happen. That's where it's going to be. And then we've also obviously got to understand where we are. So that's the other bit I've been trying to do now with all the staff and the players understanding where we are. In terms of non-negotiables, I suppose my only non-negotiables, I suppose my non-negotiables, I want to get to a stage is where we have, I hate the cynics. I suppose that's the only big one. I hate cynics. Uh, and I hate bullying. And that's probably to the degree my non-negotiables, really. The rest will evolve around what, the, what, what fits the team best. But my non-negotiables is Mike Robinson. I hate bullies. And even cynics, I'm not, it's not a non-negotiable that. It's just cynics, really. Um, sorry, it's just bullies. I hate bullies. I hate the worst side of the dressing room is the bullying. And the putting down, I suppose a non-negotiable for me is the dressing room's got to be your safe place. It's, it's your second home. It shouldn't be somewhere you're not happy and you're not comfortable to be in. When you go out on the pitch, that's your arena. That's where you're going to be uncomfortable. The training ground, you can be uncomfortable in there, definitely. But the dressing room with your mates, they're your mates. They're going to look after you. You look after each other. That's, 
that's sort of non-negotiable. I don't mean you can't have robust conversations with each other, but not just the constant putting down on people, which can happen in a meal environment. Okay, Before, I said we're going to come to team meetings. I've got one more question for you then. In terms of, and, and we hear this phrase a lot in coaching, not just in cricket, but in coaching generally, we hear the phrase about um, it being a challenging environment, but it also is a safe environment. How, how do you get that balance where it's high challenge, high support? How, how do you get that? I mean, I, I guess the worst case is when you get high challenge, no support. You, you want some support, but if you're challenging, how do you get that balance right as a coach at all levels between high challenge and high support? What's the key to it? Just try, to, just try not to deal with emotion. At the worst, it's emotion and it's not planned. So a good training session is, is sort of planned and the players are sort of signed up to it as well. So if you've got a player who you know certain things will push his button in a training session. You've almost jacked it up with him in advance. That once a week, twice a week, I'm going to, there's going to be this type of session where fragments say, you'll come in and we just change the plan on you. And you don't know what we're going to do. And we're going to completely do something different. And it's just devised design to try and press your buttons and try and get you into the anxious stage. But equally, at the back end of it, there's, there's a review about how it went, what were the lessons, what would we do better? That's, that's what you're trying to do. So everything you're trying to do is so you've got a degree of planning on it. When it goes wrong is when you, you're acting emotionally or you're not planning, you're just imposing things on players. Um, in that sense, look, it's a, it's, a, it's a tight walk that we work with. We walk as coaches and we will get it wrong. Like Barb said, oh, everybody's different. But you're just trying to, the more you understand your team, the more you understand your players, the more you can get it right um and design it right but the, 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 it's always the debrief and the support around it and what i said what are the players coping strategies did it so if it's around is in the moment it goes back to he's his really trying to control his, his breathing you're debriefing that so when it was happening could you get your breathing under control did you do your routine who did you use to did you use your non-striking partner to try and have a chat to to try and take you out the moment or did everything just fester and fester? And if you're talking about like that, then it becomes less stressful because it's it's done to improve the player. Brilliant. Right, here we go, Alex. We go into the breakouts. The question that I had, I'm gonna I'm gonna hold because on that basis, the question to you now as a group of coaches in your breakout groups to discuss is high support, high challenge. Talk, in, talk amongst your little groups about times when you've either got it absolutely right and share examples or where you've tried things and hasn't quite worked and share your, share your learning in your group. That's, that's your challenge. So you can have 10, 15 minutes in your groups. Alex can explain how that works, but discuss high challenge, high support, high challenge, low support, high support, low challenge as well, which I know I've been guilty of in the past. When I first started coaching, one of the things I wanted players to do was to like me as a coach, which meant I didn't always tell them exactly what they needed to know in the right way. So it is possible to get it wrong at both ends of that spectrum. So there, there's your first breakout group. Alex, I'll leave you to explain how we're, uh, how we're gonna go on that. Thank you. Yeah. So. I've tried to manually put you into groups, so I may have um, I may have missed somebody off. So if you do appear in a different group, I'll send you over straight away. So don't panic. Um, you're hopefully with people that you don't know as well. I haven't put you all with your mates, so you can kind of doss about for ten minutes. So you're going to get till about ten ten past eleven past um, to talk it out, and then we'll drag you back in, and we can um, we can chat away, and Paul can lead that from there. And Alex, can we have one person in each group who's prepared to uh, offer a few thoughts back? That would be, uh, so if each team as a, as a coach, um, and that coach, we're just looking for some, so the, what's the real key point? What did you discuss? And what's your real key point to come back? 
And as I say, there's no right and wrong. So, you know, there'll be nobody saying, oh, no, that's not true, whatever. It's a sharing of information amongst us as a group of coaches. So uh, enjoy your chat and it'll be a break from us too for 10 minutes as well. Okay, here we go. I'll open them now. We're in group 11. Who's in there with us? You're on your own, Paul. Everybody else popped up. Oh, just Alex. You okay, Alex? Yeah, all good. I've put it in. Hey, happy so far? Yeah, good. Yeah, very good. If there's anything at all that you think of or you want us to include or not include, we've both got our phones here, so just text through. Yeah. Um, if there's anything at all. Okay. I'll have a think. Um, I don't think I have any either. Right. Of those, so. Does everyone use this picture? Yeah. Different. Oh, we grace with the presence of the host. Yeah, I thought, yeah. I'd, come see, I thought I'd come and see this think tank. Um, <laughs> but then also, you know, some mid order batsmen that just get on with it sort of thing. Yeah. And they're not there. You're not there to support them as much as you're there to just tell them what their, their role is. So, yeah, for me, younger age groups as a coach, it's more about as much support as you can whilst trying to challenge them, but you also get the challenge back. Whereas okay. I found senior cricket captaincy, it changes person to person, but you end up more with high challenge just with how people's attitudes are. And if you don't mind me asking, because obviously I was eating whilst Paul was sort of conversating, in terms of the, when he talks about high support and high challenge, is he, is he talking about us as a coach, what we're actually giving? So yeah. the support that we're giving to them and then the challenge is how hard, hard we're pushing them? or how or... It, It's more the response that you get back from them. The response, so you, okay, cool. Yeah, so if you're going high support to a player yeah, and they're not, they just sort of get on with it, and they know their role, that's it, easy done. That's more of a low challenge because you're not getting much pushback. Whereas yeah. if somebody, if you're giving them high support, but then they're also challenging you back, asking you why, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Can it have been high challenge for yourself? Yes. That's, well, I how think... I, that's how I interpret it anyways. The best, best way to think of that, that is different. if you were to do high challenge, low support, you'd basically be saying to somebody who's never played a sweep shot, go and play a sweep shot. And I'll see you in 20 minutes. Okay. That's basically saying I'm going to make it really difficult and I'm not going to give you any help at all. So then on the flip side, I want you to play a sweep shot, but I'm going to show you how to play it. I'm going to take you through it. Then I'm going to leave you to have a go yourself. So that's and that could, you could, could you reference this again? So obviously the, there's two different aspects of the conversation. We're talking from a coaching point of view, from junior, seniors, whatever, and then a sort of a captaincy point of view. I don't know. Could you, could is this just based on sort of what we're talking in terms of what we're coaching, or could it be off field problems in terms of like somebody's a high challenge, the person's a high challenge when you you're trying to give them so much support as a person, but they won't turn up and just do the basic things. Uh, if that's you're like a sort of club yeah. captain, if you've got something to say for both, that's probably a good way of 
It's something, something as little as like, for example, like our, previously as a captain, I haven't done it for two years because I haven't played for two years, but coming back this year, taking on, taking it on again, the problem is, is sometimes you get people that you give everything to because you care so much, but then they won't just turn up and do little things like put the rope out in the morning. Yeah, so that's something. That I don't know if that's I don't know if that's relevant, but I just in terms of the high support, high challenge sort of. I don't know. I don't know if that's that's oh, why I was I, asking I, the question. I, I think yeah, cricket's an on and off field game, depending on what's um, what responsibility you are as. See, for me as a coach, if you can try and have them set really good, you know, healthy healthy routines and healthy lifestyles outside of the off the pitch then that will help with performance on the pitch. Whereas, obviously, some players will... Tr- um, it, it, it is difficult because you say you've got different nights of training and you invite your two best kids to a higher age group. You guarantee get so much negative feedback. It's Sometimes it's better off not to do that. But then that's where the challenge is, comes into it, doesn't it? <laughs> it's, you're not challenging those kids, I suppose. It's interesting. It's difficult. I think it's all about the philosophy and values of the, the club and for me, getting the parent buy-in, but that is incredibly difficult, but that's where I'd go with it, I think. yeah, You're making Definitely. the right decision for that individual, aren't you? And you're supporting and challenging for that individual, so but it is so difficult. <laughs> it is. You sort, of it, I think it sort of comes back to the philosophy, and I guess I think a vision and a philosophy early should be implemented and sort of known by by everyone so that everybody's on the same page. And I guess the challenges and things almost change when, you know, it's these, say, the two kids that have gone up to um, a slightly higher level. You then know that they're, that's due to the philosophy or vision being we want them to play at the highest possible level, which they can. Uh, I mean... Uh... I'm not particularly fully, I'm not sure anyone really knows the full, exactly what went on. Uh, but, no, uh, your opinion though. Uh, I, I think they probably did the right thing, but I mean, that's all a bit of a, a cop out of an answer, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> Graham Gooch said, if you lent Kevin Peterson a thousand pound and never spoke to him again, he'd consider it money well spent. <laughs> That's one. That's a, it's a subjective opinion, right? Everyone's going to have a different opinion. Yeah. And as we said, we we don't know. So, I mean, the the, the same uh, people like Hat Harmison has come out and actually supported him on it. And then you look at people like Stuart Broad, Anderson. They've been described as difficult as individuals. So, if if we're talking about that kind of level, we don't know the true story. Um, and it's a subjective opinion. Um, so yeah, it's I, without being in that room, uh, we we wouldn't be able to judge really we can just do as spectators I think coaching has moved on um, and head coaches have moved on from that sort of era so I think if you speak to Andy Flower and if you watch the series done about rising to number one he said the one thing that he would change he'd start putting people first before the cricket and what he meant was that all of his targets were uh, cricket based and which didn't really take into people, you know, in a cricket team, some people have got family, some people might have somebody, their father ill or something like that. So they've all got, and that's what goes back to coaching people first and understand. Yeah. Um, I was listening to a podcast about um, Justin Langer losing the Australian dressing room at the moment. I thought it was really interesting because obviously he's so unique in the way he goes about his coaching and, also how he presents himself in the media um, for the Australian players to now be coming out and saying, actually, you know, uh, the media's come out and say that he's losing the dressing room. You think like, why is that? Is, is he taking it that one step too far? Like, is he, you know, those like terror, what, terror chooses or whatever you call them, you know, with like this absolute bombardment with, but with minimal support. You have that issue where we have got massive different kids in the in the same group, as you say. Yeah. With one of them, you can be blunt and tell him, "Yes, you are bowling shit," and the other one, you you just cannot do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's learning the person, though, that, and that's the yeah. the key part when you're talking about high levels or low levels of support. And you guys, as captains, have 
of open age teams and second and third teams, you, you'll understand them people and, and where they need to go. Have you joined us, Rosie? You're on mute, mate. <laughs> I have. I thought I'd come and see this think tank and see what's uh, <laughs> see what's coming out. We forgot the question. To be fair, <laughs> well, I did anyway. <laughs> so engrossed in the conversation. <laughs> well, I'm going to dip out. I've, 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 I've stopped your conversation here. So. No, to, be, to be fair, we we got to about five past, and we we're like, oh, "God, you still going to five more minutes?" So. <laughs> Some good chats going on there. Good, excellent. People talking about Justin Langer. People are talking about um, KP by the sound of things. They're talking about all sorts. Loads of two. That'll work okay as one person from each team will just nip through. What was your key thing? What was your key learning from your group? Yeah, yeah, it will. It'll be really good. And then we'll. I'll get Mark to sort of um, pick up on a few of the points. We can discuss and as yeah. I say if we go through to sort of about half past seven and we'll go to another breakout for yeah. 10 minutes gives them a bit I think coaches love talking don't they that's why we coach yeah. so better talk rather than just stare at us for an hour and a half yeah makes it a lot well we've got a few got like Dean Headley's on here I yeah I saw that yeah brilliant he, he was the one instigating the, the KP chat so that'll be interesting to see what they say ah, okay brilliant so that'll be good brilliant um, the only thing I want to make sure is to make sure we hit those guys that are people like third team captains or second team captains that are maybe have to deal with, um, you know, challenging the younger players that are coming into that as well. So I don't know whether that, I, I mean, it's difficult and some groups will bring it up because they're talking about it. So just um, conscious to make sure we give, give them something yeah. they can take away, I guess. Yeah, but no problem. I'm sure we will. Right. Shall I call him back in now? Should I give him 30 yep. seconds more? Here we go. You know what, Christian? Any mask are you going to stay up? Danny Maskell, are you going to stay up or are you, are you going down? Then it's fit. But then? Oh. He's shouting and away at me. <laughs> Danny Maskell, I want to know if commentary is going down or staying up. From right. down. Yes. 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 My blues, mate, will be fine. Yes. Love that. Love the positivity. Come on. Golly, Lee. Guy be warm, mate. Guys, just pop yourselves on mute if you're not. Sounds like some kids are getting restless. So. Lovely. We got everyone back in. Yeah. Yeah, we're good, I think. Okay, Alex. Brilliant. So the, the, the key thing, obviously, from some of those... Uh, some of those conversations that are taking place in your breakout groups, um, it sounds as though uh, there was a few, uh, a few key topics were being discuss, uh, discussed. Um, maybe uh, a, a very famous international England batsman at number four, maybe he was being discussed. Um, one of the best players we've probably ever seen. Sadly, he talked about more for his, uh, his role in the team than his on field performances, but I'm sure. Uh, Dean Headley is joining us, which is great. Um, I love the view on that one. Um, I also, I'm guessing there would have been a bit of chat about the current Australian situation with Justin Langer. Uh, I'm sure that his name would have been discussed. Um, 
And it's amazing, isn't it, how coaches um, get sort of labels as, oh, yeah, they're really intense, or, no, oh, they're really relaxed, yeah, really good. Um, and don't forget, not our style as a coach doesn't suit everybody in our team. And, and as Robbo said earlier, you know, it's about understanding the player. What, do you, what does the player need from you? Um, and I, I work on the basis now. I didn't always. Um, experience has taught me that actually um, every player needs something from you as a coach. And the only way you're going to find out what it is, you've got to get to know them. You've got to understand them because you can't treat everybody exactly the same. So we'll come to the groups then. Alex, do you want to, as you've got the... Uh, the group set do you want to ask the first coach to uh, offer their views yeah sure we'll go reverse order so room nine so if you're in room nine so danny ed george anthony yeah I, I think i said i'd talk on behalf of group nine so we first of all ask sort of what um team or what sort of level we're looking at whether it's like a club team this club coaching in general or whether we're talking about a county team um, but Danny made the point that any coaching session he does, he's looking to create some sort of challenge. Um, kids he's got, so you know, even the most basic sessions, you're looking to challenge every time. Um, we talked about the importance of not really seeing it as a, yes, the team's important, uh, but it's the individuals, obviously, that make up the team. So giving team massive telling offs when you lose is really helpful, particularly after you've lost. If you're ever going to give a team telling off, maybe when 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 you've won, but but most of the time team tellings off aren't relevant. It's got to be individualised. Um, it's really and Anthony was saying this. It's really hard to give even levels of support because you've got so many kids that you're dealing with, and then parents are always on your back about favouritism, and you've got selection issues. So, yes, you have to give a good level of support, but at times it can't be that high because you've got so many kids to manage. And the most important thing is that it's equal. So that's a real challenge. Ed, can um, I stop you there? Ed, Ed can I stop you yeah. there? A uh, really interesting point already. I think, and this is a personal view, it doesn't matter what level you're working at, whether that's under sevens, nines, elevens, the England team, all right, I reckon that you're always looking to challenge. But the other big thing that you mentioned there is about the level of support. Again, and I guarantee you this, the higher up the levels you go, the more needy players become. Okay, so in terms of that level of support, even in an international dressing room, you've got to be really careful about how you word things. That, that, that is an absolute definite. And the other point that you make there about team telling offs, we, we've all done that. We've all made that mistake of telling the team off when actually there's only one person or two people in the team, but we haven't perhaps had the courage or had the skills or the tools to know how to do it. And again, that's what experience teaches you. So uh, thank you very much for that. Can, can we move on to um, the next team, Alex? I'm conscious that we've got a lot of coaches and I know that all of us as coaches like talking. So let's make sure we get every, every group through. So room eight, so Gareth, Kevin, Lizzie, Tom. Yeah, so I think I was nominated to speak on behalf of this group. Um, we had a lot of experience at different levels in this group. So from club cricket up to um, county age group. So me personally, I'm work with county age group under 15s. Um, I think for us, we sort of talked about um, as, the, as players are getting older, finding their roles and their responsibilities. So putting ownership on the players. Um, but that was an interesting point that you both just made about um, um, uh, players becoming sort of more needy as they get older. We find, I find personally that um, the older the age group that I'm working with, the more that they want to interact with us as coaches and the more that they're looking for that intervention and that support. Um, can you, can you get, Lizzie, can you give us an example of that then? Give us an example of how, as players get older, they want to interact more with your coach. Is that that they ask you more questions? 
Is it that they challenge perhaps you as a coach a little bit more? That you're you've got to be ready for those challenges as a coach? Yeah, absolutely. So um I think to an under 13 festival, um, that um the players were very much sort of um yes coach, no coach, you know, carry on as we are. Um, but then working with under 18 girls and girls on the regional development um program they're more than happy to challenge you and more than happy to question why why are you telling me that why do i need to do it like that why is this the way it is and as a coach you have to be prepared to answer those questions and engage in a dialogue i think that's really important having that dialogue with players it's not just well i have the coaching experience therefore if they have something that they want to you know, if they want to interact with us, then we actively should encourage that. Brilliant. And I'm going to ask you one more question then. And I reckon there'll be a lot of coaches on here really interested in your answer here. And I'm going to ask Robbo the same question. What happens when you get challenged by a player, but you don't actually know the answer? How do you deal with that as a coach? How have you, so I'll, ask, I'll, I'll phrase it slightly differently. How did you react as a coach when players started to challenge you? Were you, were you comfortable with that as a coach? Initially, no. Um, I was quite surprised that um, I was being challenged and um, that their opinion, you know, that they had something that I hadn't thought of kind of caught me off guard a little bit to be honest um for me if when I've been in that situation where I don't know the answer you sort of you draw on resources that you have available to you maybe other coaches um and you know you you make it you make it your responsibility to find it out for them yeah um, and then you can feed it back and say last week when we talked about this this is how we can sort of improve on it going forward. Brilliant. Thank you. Robbo, you must have been in that position when a player's challenged you and you didn't actually know the answer. Dean has just popped up his view. There's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know, and I'll endeavour to find out. What, what, uh, what, what would have you done in that situation? Because it must have happened to you, even as a younger coach, inexperienced coach starting off, players start to challenge you. How have you dealt with that? I think first of all you've got to say you might you've got to feel you might be wrong. That's okay. To be actually the discussion be called it is a discussion, and actually if you listen properly, then they might be right, and that's okay. So you've got to be comfortable like that. Um, you try to go in four hard. So you, if I ever have a proper appraisal, sit down with the player, I hope I've got all the information, stats I need on it. But you're right. Sometimes in a session it is. I don't know, I'll get back to you, we'll ask, or B, tell me more. That's not a bad idea. Maybe we should have explore that. What do we think? Brilliant. I, I, I'll give you an example at the highest level. Alistair Cook, in his net time before a test match, if I was throwing to him and I set off to walk down the net, and this happened many times to me, he would shout at me as I started off, this better be good. And very often I turned on my heels and walked back because it wasn't that good. And then the next day or later that day, he might catch me around the hotel or the changing room and he'd say, what were you going to say earlier? And I'd say, oh, I just felt your front foot was getting across your back foot. And he might say something like, tell me something I don't know. Or I might say, I just felt that you're pushing at the ball a little bit. And he'd say, yeah, 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 you're right. I was but he didn't want his batting time disturbed. That was his time, and it had to be really good to stop his batting time. So, again, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with um, admitting that you've got to think about that. Alex, let's go on to the next group, please. Uh, room seven. Yeah, so I was volunteer for this one. Uh, so, in our group, we had uh, a good discussion about um, different types of squads we've had, if we dealt with in the past. So, a good example that Sam brought up was that um, his girl side um, went into a boys' league a few years ago and trying to deal with a sort of um, motivating them to believe that they can compete at that level, which obviously they they could be in county county um, 
players, um, but that sort of challenge of how to sort of make them believe they can do that. Uh, another example we had was um, was having a group of players where you're you know you've got mixed abilities in that side. I think we've all experienced this at, um, at club level, especially and how to get the best out of each player at that level. So you might have some counter players in your side, you might have some standard club players as well, but it's like getting the best out of all those players in your team rather than relying on the certain top end players in that side to make sure that the whole team ethos is, is what your sort of club's all about, essentially. So an example that I, I gave was that having, having a side with that sort of mixture is, can you give that player who is a counter player, say that challenge of, not necessarily captain the side, but all, but almost like challenging the younger players or the less experienced players in that same side to take on a role of opening bowler, opening batsman, or just take on those more um, difficult roles to so not only push them, but also to help the players who are deemed more, more talented to become leaders, not only by voices, but by action as well. So I think that's quite a key ability as a coach to try and not just rely upon who your players are and what talents they've got, but also look a bit deeper than that and actually think about what have they got inside them that's actually equally as tan- talented as the skills you show on the pitch. So those are the key things we sort of we sort of came up against and thought about in our in our chat. Okay, and I said earlier about the key thing for all of us as coaches is that this happens at all levels, and and I know there'll be a lot of you. Um, that are working in club cricket with mixed abilities, with bigger groups, but it's exactly the same at whatever level you work at. Because you, not every bowler in the England team is capable of doing what Jimmy Anderson does. Not every batsman is capable of playing the way that Joe Root does. And you've got to find a way to understand them and help them to get to that next level. Coaching is all about getting people to the next level achieving something consistently and seeing if you can get them to the next level, achieve something better. And a great example in professional cricket is about the second 11. In the second 11, you have a couple of professionals who are really grumpy because they're in the second team and they're not in the first team. You've got a couple of players who perhaps have had injuries and, and know that they're just getting practice to get back in the team. You've got a couple of young professionals who've just got a contract to try and earn another one. And you've got a couple of academy players or trialists who are trying to earn a contract. And that, and that's the same. That's why I say every team has the same characters. They've just got different names. So, you know, you, you could be coaching and uh, I'm picking on, you know, old Edwardian's third 11. You've got people who are trying to get back into the second team and get back to the first team. You've got people who are content playing at that level. And not everybody wants pushing to the next level, but they want to enjoy their game. And, you, and as a as a captain, as a coach, you just got to find a way to make sure that everyone has contributed somehow and given themselves the best chance of, of actually achieving what they want out of the day. Let's move on to the next group, Alex. Brilliant. So far, thank you. Room six. Uh, I think that I think that's us. So we focused really on. Uh, three main points. So we started discussing the kind of different environments that, that we work in, and it was between the group quite quite varied in terms of uh, myself doing DOE coaching to to club coaching with younger age groups, and then to to open age club captaincies and and what the different environments that we're we're working or playing in, and the the different approaches to our to our level of challenge and support. So. Uh, Myself individually would think about potentially a lower support but higher challenge uh, in my environment. But then the the club coach is working with the with the younger guys, thinking about potentially a, a higher level of support, which is really really important to to make sure that everybody gets something from the session. Um, we went on to discuss that we need to understand all the people that we're working with. So whether that is in a a coaching session of fifteen to twenty people, or whether that's a a second or third eleven on a Saturday afternoon that we need to understand all of the all of the different people and the way for them to to develop the best. And then we kind of just rounded it up at, at the end by just saying that everything that we should do as a team of coaches or captains, we should we should strive for success at the end. And whether it's a coaching session or whether it's the end of playing a Saturday, that every player goes away with a certain level of success that 
that gives them a positive aspect of, of that game or that session of, the, of cricket. Is that, is, that yeah. a, is that a bit you is that practical is that always i'm not sure not sure where i sit with that one whether that is actually reality well, think, or is it is it just a bit romantic to think that can happen uh, yeah I, I think whether it in in the real world whether there's a real aspect to that but i think we should certainly look in terms of the the aspiration of the planning of, of what we're doing that, that there should be some sort of end goal towards the the end of end of certainly a session that the, there is some sort of level of success that whether that's been a really challenging session and as a players found that really difficult um we should hopefully still have have the end goal of, of success or a, or a long-term target to to achieve because I, I think it's understanding what success is that's which i and i've done i've done a lot of coaching the young players this winter for one thing trying to get them to understand what success is so success might not be having the best ever session. Success is where you're going to be in two or three weeks. And sometimes the ugly sessions they have are going to be down the line, the best sessions. So you don't want them going away crying, but you're trying to get them to understand what's happened in the day and why it's happened and why it makes them better. But I, I don't know, they will always go away okay. And we have to be comfortable with that and equally knowing we've given out the best support around them. But they will always go away okay. Chris, you're going to get the final word on this. Come back. This is brilliant. This is what good coaches, and, and it's really interesting, whilst you were talking then about, um, you said about understanding all the people you're working with, I think sometimes we forget about the coaches we're working with and making sure that they're going away feeling they've contributed as well. So it's important in a, in a group of coaches, and again, whatever level you're working at, that every coach has gone away feeling they've made a contribution as well. So Chris, come on, you come back at Robbo. He's not going to get another say here. You're going to close this one out. <laughs> well, well, in, in terms of the coaches to start with, I, I mean, I actually did just say in the in the uh, the small group where we were in that the the one thing that I'm very conscious when I'm working with the team of coaches with the under 11s is the sound of my own voice. Uh, and kind of going on for too long. And Alex that works with me probably can agree with that, that, that sometimes um, that is an issue that, that I um, have to think about. So certainly in terms of the other coaching, coaches feeling like they get something out of that session might be something that I would need to consider further. In terms of the, the level of success, I suppose it, it, it's an important point that we've, that we've mentioned is what is success and what does that look like and, and how we vary that level of success that going down to the, our club coaches again, that catching or hitting a ball for the very first time, whether we know that or not, that could be a level of success and, and that could be a little child going, to, going home to mum or dad and saying how good that cricket session was, or, or that could be a, an elite player facing 85 mile an hour, not getting out for, for the first time on a machine. So uh, understanding that level of success as, as much as we can uh, will, help, will help us in the long term, I think. Brilliant. Fantastic. And as I say, Robbo's not getting a right reply here. But the one thing I would say with that, in terms of that question about success, and I'll throw this one out, not for an answer, but to have a think about, in order to gauge success, we've got to actually work out what the starting point was. So it's really important that we know what the starting point was before we actually try and assess the end goal. So work out the big, where we start, and then you can work out whether you've had any success or not. And I think a lot of us as coaches fall into that trap of trying to get success without being realistic in terms of where was the starting goal? What was the starting point for that player or team before you judge success? And there's also the other part of that is the different levels of coaching means that you're, what you're judged on is very different. So what Chris Silverwood is judged on in the England team is very different to how Graham Thorpe would be judged as, a, as an assistant coach in that team, or John Lewis or Graham Welsh who's working with him. So everybody's level of judgment is different as well. Alex, let's move on. Chris, that was brilliant. Let's move on, Alex. Next one. Yeah, so room five. Is that potentially us? I'm taking the silence. It might be us. That's you, yeah. Come on, Bob. 
What have you got? Uh, yeah, so I, I'm speaking on behalf of Richard, Rupert and Raj. Um, so predominantly um, they're junior coaches or coaches of juniors. Um, I sort of cover both grounds because I'm a head coach of a cricket club and um, head of cricket at high school. So it was quite interesting sort of seeing the different dynamics of what the challenges are. Um, we all agreed though on a few common things. So one thing was definitely we needed sort of to understand or clubs and teams needed to understand common goals. Um, so just, it doesn't matter whether it's a under 11 team or first team at a you know, county league. Um, we thought it's all very important if it's, you know, we need to understand if it's, if you're going to try and win the league or if it's more about inclusivity. Um, then got us chatting about common goals in terms of selection and whether parents understand that. Um, we also had a good, good chat actually about the types of challenges and support. So kind of in agreement that everyone needs a little bit of everything or maybe more of one than the other. So sometimes juniors do need more support. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes seniors need a lot more support and take the challenge away. Um, so yeah, kind of like a, a bit of a, a bit of a mix, not a mixed view on that, but an understanding that there are mixed approaches that are required, I guess. Okay. Go for it, go on, go on. Oh, good, right. And Rob, come on, Rob, he's agreeing with someone. We're making progress. Fantastic. Um, Rob, I'm interested on, on the common goals approach. And I think that that would be something that there was a lot of people nodding that I can see on the screen when you talked about common goals. From your experience, what have you done that's worked to get the common goals? What, what have you tried that's worked and been successful? So I, I, I quite like at the start of the season almost having... Um, or start of a pre-season, just almost like documents I'll hand out to like the first team or senior section of a club or the whole of the cricketers at the school and basically sort of saying this is the journey that we're going on. Um, I think that's the, the easiest forum to, you know, to have questions aimed at you rather than someone halfway through the season challenging you going, hold on, this isn't what I've signed up to. So then immediately from day dot, there's clarity. So everyone knows what the goals are. Um, you can then address that. There might be questions there. It might be, okay, you know, how, how are we actually going to do that? Um, but I kind of think clarity from the first day, like literally giving people handouts and this is how it's going to go, I think is the easiest. That's what I found. Fantastic. I'll give you an example. Um, a guy called David Parnaby, who was the academy director at Middlesbrough Football Club. I went to visit him once. And he gave me some great insight into what they did at Middlesbrough. And they basically ran all of their age groups from under nine to under 17s at the time, as a lot of you that are teachers would do. They had regular parents' evenings. They explained how each team would operate, what each team's philosophy was in terms of coaching and playing. And he talked about once you got to sort of under 15, 16, 17, it was about winning. At 11, 12, 13, it was about teamwork. And at seven, eight, nines, it was very much about skill levels. And he, he gave an example that he, he explained to the parents of the under 15s that we're moving into a period now of winning. And if your son plays left back and he's a very talented left back, don't come to me after six weeks and say, my son has had a shot on goal and needs to play centre forward because actually this is now about winning. But at the earlier age groups, it was about moving people around. And I guess that's the something that for all of us that work at different levels, if you're working with a club side under 13, for instance, you're trying to give everybody a, a go. You're trying to give everybody a chance to play. It may be that at county under 15 level, you get to that stage where actually if, if the same person opens the batting and the bowling, there's nothing wrong with that. And if you communicate that with the parents and the players, you've got less chance of having blow-ups with parents and players as the season unfolds. But that was something that worked from football, which I took and used in, in youth cricket. And there'll be one or two of you saying, absolute nonsense, garbage, try that, it doesn't work. But I think the communication in terms of your goals is absolutely spot on, Rob. I think we would all, uh, all agree with that. Fantastic, thank you. Can I Alex, just, sorry. I took it to, on, on the same thing. So I go, I always want to try and find a cause. I try and unite a team with a cause. I try and find an identity. 
So that you, you know, we've I've just been discussing it today about rules, dress what we dress, things like that. You're trying to find something that gives them an identity as a team, who they are, and, and I always try and find a cause. So Sussex, we were smaller than all the big boys. But shit, we love to punch the big boys on the nose. We didn't have their budget, we didn't have their stands, but we're tighter, we're smaller. We do it better, we do it closer. It was a cause. And we played for this small club who, who did everything closer and better. That was our unique bit. The, the England um, women, I had to very quickly lose my male act lens. So the, and it was interesting, Lizzie's point. So, that, so I, I quickly discovered the girls, they needed information. They needed to know why, what. If I wasn't giving that to them, I was losing them straight away. So we got the, the girls' bit. Initially, I go in wanting them to be more competitive with a typical bloke's arrogant view. Well, actually, the best win I got by the girls was understanding they wanted to be together. They wanted to win, but they wanted to win with people alike, having fun, etc. So if we could have, I appealed to their togetherness. We never leave a sister behind. We sort of became their motto. So you're just trying to find your way to unite them, give them a cause, an identity, whatever team it is, junior team, senior team. Brilliant. Thank you. Cheers, well, thank you as well. Fantastic. Thanks. Alex, next group. Yeah, we're on to KP room. Room four. Hey, guys. Yes, that was our group. Jinko, you was... Who have we got? Who's... Who's... Who's chatting from that group? So it's either Dean, Ed, Kalim, or Lewis. Yeah, sorry guys, so it's, it's uh, myself. So Kale uh, Kalimia. So um, group was made of uh, yeah professional cricketer, county age groups, and junior club coaches. Um, we kind of discussed about um, about challenges and what we had, and what cricket has become to be more of a you know it's coaching the person and being flexible. Um, and it's, uh, it's seeing what, uh, what sport a, a player would need. So if you give them a problem, how much support do they need to uh, solve that problem? Um, and then we kind of discussed, um, I think, something that you, you touched on earlier around uh, KP, etc. And it's a case of we, we, we looked at uh, what other sports did. Um, so there were prime examples of, say, news, uh, All Blacks, they've got policy, no dickheads. Um, so it's a team game, so winning together. And we also touched kind of NBA, uh, which was Dennis Rodman, with the team kind of, um, there's a team buy-in to give him a night out in Las Vegas. Um, but it's kind of interesting to see how other um, teams, other sports kind of approach it, which goes back to your guys uh, previous thing about Middlesbrough and, and football. Um, and we, we kind of, uh, yeah, we, we, we discussed about, it's also about the team. Um, it's about winning together as a, as a team and not having, um, you know, e egos in the team. Brilliant. Thank you very much Great for that. examples, weren't they? Yeah. Two contrasting All Blacks against the last stance. Yeah. Different approaches, both working. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, in, in terms of that um, coaching the person, um, I think it was Ian McGeekin, rugby coach, who was on at the weekend talking about the England-Scotland game. Um, I remember him talking at a conference about good coaches coach technique, great coaches coach the person, the, the people. And, and that's something that has stuck with me. And I'm going to give you another Trevor Bayliss example. Trevor Bayliss thinks that a lot of English coaches are too technically based because we can hide behind technique because it's written in a book or it's on a DVD or we've seen it chatted about on television on Sky, where incidentally Sky analysed the England players more than the England dressing room do technically. And you actually find some of the players watching themselves being analysed and then coming and saying, I saw NASA talking about my technique on TV. Um, what do you reckon? And that, I promise you that genuinely happens. So Trevor's view is that as coaches in England, we talk too much about technique. And the reason we don't talk about the tactical side of the game how to score runs, how to take wickets, is it because it means we have to have our opinion and we perhaps go out on a limb with our opinion. And that's about what we think. And that's why I was pushing Andy a little bit earlier in that chat with Robbo, because it's really important in your environment that you have a, not only do you have a safe and challenging environment for your players, but you also have your coaching staff as well and your coaching group so that they can challenge one another in the right way at the right time. Um, so as I say, Trevor's big on that. He thinks in England we, we concentrate too much on technique. 
because it's slightly easier for us as coaches, slightly easier. Um, Cal, there was, there's other thing there you touched on um, the problem solving. Do you want to just touch, do you want to come back to that again and just explain a little bit more about the conversation you had around problem solving? Sorry, uh, problem solving. Did you touch what on the chat about problem solving? Where, where did you come with that phrase? If anybody in his group. Oh, sorry. So, so, yeah, so it's about um, how players can. Sorry, if you, if you give a challenge to a player to say, you know, can, can you resolve this issue? And some players would go out and be able to solve the problems themselves very quickly. Other players would take time. You need to give them more support. Uh, and that would go for any age group, you know, from, from younger age group to, to, to adults as, uh, um, as well. Brilliant. Dean, you want to come in there on problem solving? Well, first of all, uh... Kaleem said uh, that he'd talk and I said I'd support him. So that was uh, my support to him. But with the, with, with the problem solving, um, even from a young level, um, it's, it, the support needs to be what the player is in front of you. So you'll have a real nuggety player who loves just solving it himself. So you could let him have a go first. Are you still there? We're with you, mate. We're yeah. with you. Um, it just looked like it's frozen. Um, and you'll have another player that you know you need to explain and go through it first to explain how to do it because you know that's in their nature. But then um, there was um, a, a person in that group who was a level two coach, just qualified, and... I sort of said, well, that will grow with experience. So, for instance... You could be dropping a ball, simple drop feed to a five-year-old, hit the ball. So that's the first thing. Then you realise that one of the kids can play. Then you say, well, actually, can you hit it exactly as it hits the second bounce? Which is a bigger challenge for him. But you can leave the rest of the group and you can try and make it easier for another kid who can't hit the ball. So you might put it on, on a cone for him. So I agree with what you're saying, whether it's professional cricket or whether it's you, you know, five-year-old, you've still got to differentiate between the person and the challenge that you're setting them and the support that you give. So we, we, we talked about all of that. Brilliant. And whilst we've got you on, you, you obviously went from, you know, a, a challenging start in your career to playing for England and but for injury would have played a lot more test matches to now coaching children from the young, young, right the way through to 17, 18, 19. Girls and boys. Boys and girls, absolutely. What do you, what do you reckon, uh, for all the coaches on here, what's the single biggest change you've seen in the approach to coaching from when you started playing to where you're now coaching now? Uh, there is coaching. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, expand on that. Expand on that. Well, I don't think I was technically co coached at all until I got to playing for the England team. And what about... I was supported more as a person and you uh, had to talk to people. You know, I, I talked to an umpire or I talked to somebody who had the best sit in the house, the umpire. I talked to batsmen about, not about how to bowl. I spoke to batsmen asking them, how did I make them feel when they were at the crease? Was I threatening? And actually, I think sometimes you say that if you're a bowling coach, you talk to bowlers, but actually I think batsmen can learn a lot by talking to a bowler because they might not be able to tell them how to bat, but they can certainly say how they look vulnerable. Yeah. So um, I think there's, it's, I played county age group for Worcestershire. There was no indoor programme at all, apart from a trial day at the start of the summer. That was it. Yeah. Now, I think sometimes the kids do do too much indoors because they hit a, quite a lot of non-decision-making balls. Depends who the coach is. Um, but it's, um, it's, the coaching has, is a thousand times better. I wish I'd known about, you know, um, understanding pressure to the floor and widening my stance and all these things and... Um, because I think I would have been a better player. Okay, brilliant, mate. I might thank not have got injured either. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that. And Cal, thank you as well. Brilliant. Um, 
the, the one interesting thing there from um, Dean is, is about that sort of, again, the, I guess the level of interference is probably the wrong word, but the knowing when to and how to intervene probably is the right phrase um, for players. And again, it comes back to that understanding of, of the players that you're dealing with and, and finding out what they need. I'm also, and Dean's alluded to it there, I'm a, I'm a huge believer in, co in players learn from players and coaches facilitating that learning and understanding how that learning can improve and get better. But role models and watching other players do things and trying to copy, and we all see that. And, and I'll give you a great example. Joss Butler, not playing in a test match in South Africa a few years ago, watching A.B. de Villiers at backward point diving. And before the one day series started, we had about a week of practice. We finished our next session and he said, come with me. We went on the outfield, we got a net. And he said, right, I want you to show me how, John, how uh, A.B. dives from his right to his left he said they're different and I want to know how to do it I want to see if I can improve my diving and, and we spent an hour just rolling around on the ground trying things and I said look it, let, let's give it a go and we started on our knees diving right diving left does it change and there, there's you know Josh Butler prepared to copy another player and to say how can I do that and, and we all know as coaches at all levels players watch the television boys and girls they watch things happen and then they come to you as a coach and say, I want to be, I want to play that shot. I want to bowl that ball. I want to do that stop. I want to be that keeper. And that's where, you know, it, it's okay to say, I don't know, but I'll find out. But it's also important that we keep watching and seeing what's happening in the game. Alex, let's move on to our next group, please. Okay. In, uh, room three, that was Zach's room. Yeah, we talked about two points mainly. The first point being, obviously, trying to differentiate in terms of how you would challenge a certain group at a certain time and then trying to do it on their personalities. But one thing we really came on to was how many times do we say to players, don't be afraid to make a mistake because you can learn from it. But how many times as a coach do we try and do the same thing? So how many times do we take an approach to a player that doesn't work and we just think, oh, right, that's we've spoiled it almost? Round, take the chance, think, right, this might work with this player who you might find quite challenging to work with. And it doesn't work, but then you learn from that process. And if you get another player similar to that, then you can go, right, I've got a slightly different process to go along with it. It might just be that we've not all been in that environment. I think, you know, not everybody's dealt with every type of player in every different situation. So it might be quite intimidating to some some coaches that, you know, they start dealing with quite a challenging player. I'm not sure what to do with this. And it's there's nothing wrong with making a mistake in the, how you approach them. It's how then, if you've got that same situation again, how would you improve on that? Zach, brilliant. Look, absolutely brilliant. I, I'm going to give Robbo two minutes <laughs> to think about an example where as a coach, in a coaching environment, he tried something that was out of his comfort zone and it worked and something where he didn't. And I, I'll give you an example. I said earlier, when I started coaching, I wanted players to like me. And I also, when I started coaching, if I had a session in mind that I wanted to run at whatever level I'm talking about now, I'm talking about, you know, I, I used to coach pub teams in the old indoor school at Canterbury on a Friday night because it was a way as a young player when I was playing, I started coaching when I was 18, 19. I think I probably knew pretty quickly I wasn't going to have a long career as a player. So I quickly worked out coaching was my route. But I, I used to coach all sorts of players, kids, whatever it might be. And, and that really helped me to make loads of mistakes and improve and get better. Um, but the one thing that I was very conscious of was that if I planned a session and it was for an hour, an hour and a half, I followed that session to the nth degree. So actually the session was about me, not about the players. And I learned with experience that actually the only thing I needed to plan was the first minute. And once I planned the first minute, I then had the courage to run with what the team that I was working with or the players I was working with needed and be flexible because it's not about me as a coach. It's about the players. Robbo, 
Yeah, that's a good example and a, and a tougher example that perhaps didn't get. Let's start with the tough one in case we don't get to the good no, one. Okay. Let's start with the tough one. <laughs> uh, bowler at Sussex, uh, very technical minded. Uh, so my opinion, it was more psychological, mentally, mental the side of the game he would fail on. So I, I was more on that side. We had some real success and we freed him up and he bowled quick and he was having a, a second coming of a career, which was working brilliantly. But I, because my natural nature is to go, is not to be technical, it's more that side. I, I made a mistake with him. There's a great saying that come from something called action types, which is some people need information, some people need emotion. This, pe this person needed information. And I actually neglected some of the technical side of, of him. He actually got into a bad bowling habit because I kept, I was more about, I used humming your song back to you, Mark, and things like that. So I let a technical issue sneak into his game, which caused him a lot of anxiety because he needed information. I was almost deprived of it. And we had a bit of a blow up with his action and I set him backwards for a while. So that's a negative. Okay. We haven't got enough time for me to cover all the ones that I got wrong. So, uh, <laughs> We'll go back to uh, Zach. Anything else from your group? Uh, the only other thing was a lot of people think about on the field, not necessarily off the field. And, you know, if you do have somebody that is a challenging player, if you're not sure how to deal with them on the pitch, maybe try and get them to know them a little bit more off the pitch, find out how they are as a person, and then you can try and translate that onto the pitch. Some people just focus a little bit too much on the pitch. Absolutely. And I think as coaches working with um, children of all ages, boys and girls, sometime observing, you know, that the parents um, around their kids when they pick them up or they drop them off, chance to chat to them, um, find out a little bit about them um, and actually just seeing how the, you know, the parents interact with their kids, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that, that's also has helped me in the past um, with, with understanding and making sure that I'm pitching at the right level um, for, for the players that I'm working with. That's also a great advantage. Um, and I'll take you back to that Middlesbrough point of, you know, they almost ran parents' evenings just to give feedback. And even under nines and under tens, it wasn't necessarily to talk too much about the kids, but it was to gain as much information as they could to help them get the best out of those kids that they were working with. Uh, and that was very important as well. And I'm sure you teachers on there, that's something that you... Uh, you know and you do naturally anyway and probably don't even think about doing it and as coaches our biggest strength is our observation and watching people we do that naturally that that's how we get better as coaches we're constantly watching we watch how people are walking we watch how people are running you know we're watching how people are holding themselves in terms of their their body language whether they're enjoying it they're not enjoying it and and there are some people that we work with you know, they look like they're not enjoying it, they're not having fun. Well, they are, but it's just their natural face and it makes it doesn't, they don't always have to be smiling. And, it, and enjoyment isn't always about laughing and having fun. It's actually enjoyment for some players, again, boys and girls, is, is I want to get better. I want to challenge myself. I'm prepared to make mistakes. You know, they, that, they enjoy that. That's their nature. Alex, how many groups have we got left? We've got two left. Come on then, let's go for the next one. Uh, room two, so Andy, James, Liz, Michael. Yeah, so I'm uh, speaking on behalf of um, that group, a uh, similar kind of idea of schools and, and club uh, people working involved in that. We kind of spoke about the idea of kind of rotation of players and kind of maybe having a philosophy on how you're going to kind of rotate players and, and not having anything subjective about kind of, um, kind of the re result and the end result and kind of taking that away from it. And kind of similar to what you were talking about um, with my role as a teacher, what you're talking about, Paul, about Middlesbrough, how you have a different philosophy kind of going through the age groups, younger age groups, about opportunity, giving everyone the chance to kind of experience different situations is something I try and do in my teams is the younger age groups. Maybe you've, often you find same person bats, same person bowls and bowls in the school cricket I play. But actually, you know, if they've opened the batting in one game, maybe they bat down low, lower down and then in another game that then gives them the opportunity they might need to come in at bat, uh, um, number six and they've got five overs left or something like that so they then learn about dealing with that scenario dealing with the pressure from there rather than always being at the top of an innings um, and dealing with that situation 
And likewise, maybe your bottom end of players, you would then push them up um, and give them opportunity in somewhere that they wouldn't normally um, have that chance. Um, but you, the, you've got to be careful with that because the skill level or the little skill level um, to be able to deal with that situation and in turn fail and then lose confidence um, from it. Yeah. So there's a big thing about knowing your players and understanding what they can cope with and who can accept that challenge and then who actually just needs that bit of reassurance maybe in a, in a different situation and being flexible with batting orders, for example, go, well, this is a good opportunity for you. You can go in, um, in now. Um, and kind of from that, it kind of creates conversation. Um, and it's asked like, you know, the ability to then ask a question and then not actually want the them to respond at that time. So, you know, just to get them to think about, or well, how did you deal with that situation? Ask them a question, then just walk away at that point um, and let them deal with it. And, you know, they may come and speak to you at another point um, to kind of uh, to, talk, to talk about it and to discuss it, uh, discuss it further. Um, what kind of kind of things that we kind of spoke about there um, in our group? Brilliant, James. Thank you. I mean, I, again, I'll come to Robo in a sec, but the, the, the one thing that comes across there is you, you've got to know your starting point to be able to judge your success, haven't you? And that's exactly what you're talking about. So if you move people around, you change the practice, you change your your gameplay, whatever it is, judging success for each person that you're working with even in a larger group, is understanding their starting point so that you can actually show them their starting point and show them how they've improved from that point onwards. And, and just on that, I think it's also about the expectations, providing the expectations to the whole team and about, right, we're going to do things differently here to give everyone the opportunity to become better as a team and everyone enjoy the game. Yeah, brilliant point. Thoughts? No, perfect. It's, it's, it's just making sure there's enough balance to to give what the group needs. That's all, but it's, it's perfect. Yes, it's very good. Brilliant. Thank you, James. But last group then, Alex. Yeah, room one, Harry, Sarah, Sean. If they're still there. Who have we got? Is he on mute? Anyone? Surely we haven't got all the way yeah. through. We've got someone on mute. They've been chatting. Yeah, no, I've got, got it now. I think uh, we had a few technical problems on our side, but... Uh, uh, very much, back. yeah, very much um, the same as, as everyone spoke about, really, about um, for difficulties in planning sessions for mixed groups. I think we had uh, people that dealt with, with younger children in schools and how when you've got more talented players or players that have played a bit more cricket, how to design sessions where to challenge all at the same time, maybe get that buy-in from players to assist some of the other players to get them cohesive as a group. Uh, and working towards, a, I suppose, a common goal. Um, and then really a big thing we spoke about was what a lot of people have said about getting to know your players, whether, I mean, some people we know need an arm around the shoulder, other people need a, a kick up the backside. And, and it's good to get to know your players to see how they react to things and and know really. I think some of the best coaching I've certainly done with, with club players happens in the bar after a game and you're talking... And then all of a sudden it can be, right, let's go out tomorrow and do that and let's practice that. And, and it's getting to know the people rather than the skill, I think, um, is something we spoke about. Sean, we've been on for an hour and a half and that last bit is as good as anything that's been said tonight. I absolutely reckon that all of us as coaches have done our best bit of work, not necessarily in a net or a fielding drill, but actually, Peter Moores used to talk to me about every player will provide you with a window, just make sure you're ready when they provide you with that window. And what he was saying was, it might not always be in a net, it might just be, you know, the bar, I mean, I, I don't go in bars, so that wouldn't work for me, but it might be in a coffee shop, it might be, you know, on a coach, it might be sitting outside watching a game. One, one guy once said to me, uh, who mentored me, unfortunately passed away last year. He, he said he watched me on a game once when I was working with the England team. And he said, you were sat with three or four of the lads and you were talking and nobody else said anything. And I, every time the camera came to you for about 10 minutes, all I could see was you talking. He said, sometimes watch the game through the player's eyes. And I said, what do you mean by that? 
And he said, just sit and listen sometimes. Sit near your players and listen to how they're talking about the game. How are they understanding the game? How are they seeing the game played out? So you can actually watch the game through your players' eyes. And then actually, when you chat to them, you can actually talk to them at their level, at the right level, at a level they'll understand. And, and for me, that was, it, it might, some of you might think, well, that's pretty obvious, but that sounded brilliant to me. So that being able to find the right moment and get a point across or get them to understand something, again, is really important. Sean, brilliant, that. Anything else from your group, Sean? No, I think that was about it. It was very much along the lines of what everyone else has said. I think it's been, it's been really insightful. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Alex, is that all the groups? That's all the groups, yeah. Look, that, that's really, really good um, that we've got through every group. The, the, we had a second scenario planned. And in fact, the scenario that we came up with wasn't planned, but it just came from the way that the group had discussed. And I, I went through with Alex before we started two scenarios and we haven't touched them. But the way the conversation was going, that's why we chose that support um, question. Robbo, we're getting towards the end. Um, Dean mentioned, you know, he wishes he'd known that when he started. Um, and I'm sure all of us as coaches, as we gain experience, think, oh, I wish I'd had that knowledge a couple of years ago with that player or that team or that situation. If there was something that you know now as a coach that you wish you knew when you started coaching, what would it be? Team coaching away from, and you can't do this with schools and things like that, but I'd have more coffees with players. I think I definitely well, I would, and I do do now. I'd have more coffees, more, basically what you just said there, more away from the battle conversations, talks. Just trying to, you always try to just take the air out of somebody, just trying to settle people down. I'd be doing that a lot more to a younger Mark Robinson, definitely. I think that would be probably his biggest thing. Um, and I think having just done a bit of work at the school, actually, and mentoring a couple of the the junior coaches, I'd let, I was sort of said, I'd let a bit more chaos go. It didn't always have to be planned and formal. There was a great, I had a, I had a great um, cricket, what do they call them, director of cricket, and he, but he wanted everything. He, was, he worried about it being good and looking right and this and the other. It's such fine. Let it be chaotic. It's great. The hitting balls, the learning, the, the creating their own games. That's awesome. So I think I'd be less descriptive, a bit more, as I say, a bit more freedom. Let, let, let the chaos reign at times. So learning through play? Yeah, learning through play. Learning through play is a big one. Uh, and again, when Robbo was talking there, there was a few on there I could see nodding their heads and saying, it might be that you're dozing off, you know, Ned, but there was a few that were nodding their heads as if to say, yeah, yeah, I, I like that, I like that. Learning through play, letting things go. And that's where this, this idea of growing, and it's been mentioned by quite a few of you tonight, growing confidence of, for you as a coach. You know, go out of your comfort zone occasionally. Let, let people try things. Stand back a little bit. You don't always have to be the person to come up with the rules and the regulations of the drill. And if a player says... Could we not do this? Could we not do that? Say, okay, come on then. Show us what we're going to do. Show us how we're going to do it. And have the confidence to let that go. It hasn't always got to be perfect. That, that's the key. Because the game isn't perfect. It, it, it isn't perfect. Coaching isn't perfect. It's views, opinions, thoughts, ideas. So get as many as you can. Share as many as you can. Understand as many as you can. Um, what have we got there? Fair point, Dino. Yeah, I think that's a, that is a fair point because the, the safety side of it, it's obviously got to be safe. So if you are going to have a bit of chaos, you're going to need to probably uh, make chaos. sure you're, you're with softer balls. Plan chaos. Well, oh, planned chaos. Well, Alex, we could go on for another two hours here. Look, <laughs> we, 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 we were going. It's been brilliant. Um, the, the great thing about coaches as I say, is that we all love to have a chat. We love to talk to one another. What we would like to do for the group that have joined us tonight, what we'd like to do is invite all of you to Edgebaston at a latter part of the summer, at a time that works for everybody and a time hopefully when we can actually meet together. We'd like to invite you in for um, a couple of hours. Um, come in, our guests, um, have a beer, have a Coke, have a coffee. We'll put all on for you and come in and let's revisit some of these topics and conversations. I've kept all my notes on tonight. 
and we'll revisit it again and we'll actually do it in person and we'll do it here in one of the, the big rooms and we can do some breakout work. We can do some shared thoughts and maybe some of the things that we've talked tonight we can put into practice and that'll be for all of us, including Robbo. We'll put some thoughts, some ideas into practice. You'll try things. You might be like me. You might have a light bulb moment where in middle of July you're doing a session and something happens and you think, oh, I know what they were talking about now. I get that. And, and let's come together maybe in, as I say, later part of the summer that works. We get Alex to organise a time and a session and come in as our guests and let's actually go through some of this again. Let's revisit some of this and let's revisit a few different topics and ideas and keep chatting. Because the one thing I'm absolutely certain of, it doesn't matter what level you work at, it doesn't matter whether you get paid or you're giving up your time, which a lot of people are doing on this call. We've all got the same common goal and interest. And that's we want to see players, boys and girls, men and women, improve at whatever level they're working or playing at. And that's what drives us all as coaches. That's what intrigues us as coaches. And the one thing that I would say, and the one thing I'm going to leave you with, is don't be scared of curiosity. Don't be frightened to find out whether that's about you, your group, drills, ideas, ways of improving your practices, and don't be scared to come out of your comfort zone as a coach and give it a go, because you never know. You just never, never know what you're going to find. And obviously, you've got to do it in the right way at the right time, but you know that. So, Alex, thank you very much um, for allowing us to chat to the coaches. No, thank you. From our point of view, it's yeah. a shame it can't be in the room when you actually, from time to time, get a bit of feedback um that's quite tough talking to a screen but I, I think the way that we've done it in terms of breaking out and having breakout groups so the coaches can chat to one another hopefully that's worked and you've enjoyed it and as i say thanks for putting it on and hopefully everyone's enjoyed it well both last word no thank you very much everybody good luck for the when we eventually get going again Guys, yeah. thank you very much for signing in and thanks to you too. Brilliant. Really, really insightful. And you. like you said, we had a, a whole session planned out, but we got probably 20% of the way in because of how much information people want to want to share and have got on. So um, like Paul said, I'll get in touch about a date probably later in the summer when we can, when we can do that. Um, and in the meantime, we're going to put on another couple of workshops over probably March and early April. Um, so keep an eye out for them if you want to, you want to tune in, but, Guys, thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. Um, this will be, it's been recorded, so it'll be on YouTube if you want to go back and think, right, did I make sense or I missed that point that Paul or Mark made? So, um, and if you've got any burning questions that you wanted to ask them, drop me a, an email and I'll, I'll send yeah. it on. We can do it that way. Definitely. Definitely. And good luck, everyone. Keep enjoying your coaching and thanks very much for your time tonight. Brilliant. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Thank See you. you. All. Thank you. Cheers.